All right. We are back. We are back with the Out of the Cave podcast. Hello. Thank you for being here. Welcome back. Today, we have juiciness ahead. (laughs) That is what I know for sure. I'm sitting here with a new friend. I'm sitting here with a new friend and I'm going to I'm going to take some time with this introduction right now. That's how I feel. Here's what I want to say. I'm sitting here with a medical doctor. We're going to talk more about that. But the the way that I was connected to Susan, thank you for being here. The way that I was connected to Susan was one day I got an application for my group program and in my application it says Where did you hear about me? How did you find me? And the answer in this application was, my doctor recommended your podcast. And so I got very curious and I said, who is this doctor? Do I know them? Where are they? Where are the doctors that know about the Out of the Cave podcast and are giving it to their their patients? And so I followed the thread (laughs) and one of my clients led me directly to her primary care doctor someone that I did not know and had no connection with, states away, still on the East Coast, but but states away. And we had never been in touch directly. And I thought, well, damn, this is amazing. And also the goal in many ways. So like I said, I followed the thread and I said, Susan, <laughs> I wanna know you. You are out there doing the work that you do and you are recommending the Out of the Cave podcast. Who are you? <laughs> And can we have a conversation? And so we had a conversation. And in that conversation, I said, are you willing to be a guest on this podcast? And she said, yes. And that is who I'm sitting with today. And so I am super excited as usual. But I also want to say, so that's part one. That's what brings us here today. Part two is the reason and the intention that I wanted to have this episode put together is because if you are someone listening to this that has ever struggled with your weight or currently struggles with your weight, particularly those of you that are in bigger bodies, you probably know that going to the doctor can suck a lot. For me personally, going to the doctor as a kid was the worst day of the year. I had to get a checkup once a year. And I did everything I could to avoid it and prevent it and push it off as long as possible. And I have a lot of going to the doctor trauma, specifically around my weight. So this is a personal thing for me. But also a lot of the people that I work with have had, you know, have told me so many horror stories about what it's like to be seen by medical professional Mm -hmm. and how just how terrible that can be. And so when I connect with someone, but specifically a primary care doctor who is seeing humans, not bodies, and treating people like people rather than a set of data, I am compelled to connect. And I was excited to have this episode because I just want there to be more hope (laughs) that if you are seeing a medical professional who doesn't see you as a human, it doesn't mean that that is true for every medical professional. And it's very inspiring to me when I talk to Susan to hear about how she sits with people and treats people and learns about people and takes care of people. And it's, it's just amazing to me that there are primary care medical doctors who are out there that can do that and that are doing that. So I said, I want you on my podcast so people know that you're out there and people like you are out there. So that is what we're doing here today. To say I'm excited is an understatement. So that's the introduction. This is probably the longest introduction ever on this podcast. Welcome, Susan. Thank you for being here. Tell me a little bit, you know, introduce yourself. Who are you? Where are you? Go for it. Dive right All right. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. That was very lovely. Um, I like to hide a lot. <laughs> so when you reached out, I was like, oh, shoot, I've been noticed. Darn it. Like, <laughs> I'm being called out. But 
<laughs> anyway, it's like my little light. I like to hide my light. And Lisa's like, oh, uh-uh. Like, we got to talk about it. So I appreciate that. Um, so I am in South Louisiana. Um, I am a primary care physician specializing in internal medicine with a little um, extra specialty in women's reproductive health, but we can get back to that. Um, I um, have three young adult children who are wonderfully complex and beautiful <laughs> and challenge me every day to grow and grow and grow. Um, and remind me that humanity is so messy. And I think that's kind of, yeah, I'm happily single, divorced, um, but very much fulfilled um, in my life. So yeah, I, I think that's kind of the the gist of, of yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That I've I've said before is usually like the hardest question. You know, who are you? And people are like, uh, there's there's a lot to say. So thank you for starting us there. <clears throat> That's the other thing too. I think the perspective that you're offering, you are a doctor, you're also a mother, and you're a human in many ways. So, okay. Tell me a little bit about tell me a little bit about the work that you do and how you arrived at this place where this is the work that you do. Ooh. So um I just <laughs> I this is just so funny. So in in college I chose to study psychology because I was fascinated with the inner workings of humans cuz I realized that man I had some very weird stuff, you know, growing up and I didn't understand why my parents did what they did and why my brother did what he did and why, you know, I just wanted to know, like, why do people do what they do? I need to understand this. But soon recognized that psychology was too squishy. There was not enough certainty. Yeah. Like it was not enough certainty for me. It didn't answer my questions. It didn't tell me what I needed to know. It was just way too many questions and not enough answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because humans are like that. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time and I wasn't um, able to sit with that uncertainty at the time. So um, I thought about, okay, well, what am I going to do? Because humans are kind of cool, but psychology is weird. And anyway, so I decided to go to medical school because it seemed like I could, you know, do well on tests. You know, I yeah. had, you know, I'm, I can, I'm, I kind of understand these things. I can make A's on tests, you know? So I kind of went that route and love the science, love the data, love the problem. Let's, let's find the problem. Let's fix it. It was so concrete. And so like, I can do this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Primary care. I'm not sure why I chose that other than, again, I, there's this fascination with the inner realm of the person um, and I loved the idea of getting to know someone and, um, and, and carrying that through and, and getting, you know, anyways, all these, all these paradoxes. Um, and so chose, um, internal medicine and pediatrics, but I'm no longer treating children, but this whole idea of the development of the person and, and then the diseases that come along. But when I started practicing, it was like the opposite, right? Like, I, I was focusing, okay, let's focus on the blood pressure. Let's focus on the numbers. Let's, right. let's get this cholesterol down. I've got the medicine for you, you know? <laughs> right, right. Let's fix the, you know, let's find the problem and get the pill to go with the problem. And that was what I did mm -hmm. <laughs> for a while. And I realized that that doesn't work, A, and it misses the person. It, it really does. And then the person keeps coming back, not fixed. And so then that reflects on me. I must be doing something wrong. So how do you reconcile with that? Like, you know, and then, I, and then I noticed because I have this huge empathy, like I, that's just a part of me. It's, I'm very empathetic. I see people's problems so I was seeing all this, pro all the internal pain that was driving, you know, their addictions or their 
troubled relationships or whatever. And I was powerless. I, the what the tools I had been given mm -hmm. rendered me powerless to do anything about it. Yeah. And that's a bad place to yeah. be in. Yeah. And I think that drives a lot of burnout for doctors. Um, and it, I think it pushes doctors into this kind of robotic, aut automatic way of reflexively dealing with people. And then that turns into gaslighting. <laughs> because in other words, if if I gave you the medicine and it didn't fix you, well, you must be doing something. Mm. It's not me. Mm -hmm. I can't handle that. Mm -hmm. That I would be needing to do something differently. So it must be you. You must be. I mean, I just get a pit in my stomach when I'm saying this because this is just so real. Yeah. So um, I got really, um, what's the word? I, I just felt like I can't do this. I can't do this because I'm faced with this reality of the complexity of the person. I can't fix it. So therefore, I must be in the wrong place. So by this time... Um, I had, I was married. I had, um, three children, maybe, you know, between 10, five and 10. Um, I had over a hundred thousand dollars in debt in medical school. Like there was no, you know, moving to a different career. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I knew yeah. I had to stick it out. People depended on me. So I had a great idea. I was going to change my specialty to dermatology mm -hmm. <laughs> because there there's no complexity right burn it off slap a salve on it like and there's no like I don't need to hear about their problems I don't need my empathy can stay outside the room uh-huh uh -huh. I can just negate that part of me show up and 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 man and then I can have more stuff. I can travel. I can live this happy, fulfilled life because that's in my mind, you know, just make more money, have less, you know, problems. That was the my recipe, okay? Naturally. <laughs> so, right, right. So real, so human. And so I, um, I went about that, tried hard to make that happen. And of course, I didn't get accepted into that program. So there I was stuck mm -hmm. in that place. And, and so um, it was really, I had, I, I didn't know what to do. And that was the most beautiful place I've ever been in, really, if you think about it. Yeah. Right. And we all have to get that to that place of like, okay, I'm powerless now. I, I have a desire to, you know, that my desire was still, you know, anyway, to, to, I still loved medicine, but how was I going to make that work? So there was a journey, there was a mm -hmm. journey there. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, kind of got reconnected to, I had been spiritually like disconnected from, um, um, my faith. Um, I started to like think more deeply about things and people and start to say, okay, let me, let me, okay. How, how about this? I'm going to walk into each room and pay attention, right? A little bit deeper and listen to people a little bit more because maybe, you know, I don't know. I, I, I didn't understand really what was happening. And so at that time, what was most glaring to me was, um, I started to pay more attention to women's health and the idea, um, cause it, it happens everywhere in medicine, what, what we just talked about that dynamic, yeah. but especially around this idea of women's health. Pro so I, my own journey was, um, had a lot of problems with my periods and I took birth control for 10 years mm -hmm. for that. And then ended up unable to conceive. And so I started to realize, wait a second, we, and then used IVF in vitro fertilization to conceive my children. So when I really took a step back and looked at the way that I was being treated in that, it was totally dismissive of what was mm -hmm. actually happening in my body and in my mind and in my relationships. And in, you know, 
And it was very much, well, this will be the answer. And it's this very superficial, one size fits all, Band-Aid kind of approach um, that rendered me basically sterile so that I would have to be fixed mm -hmm. with another medical procedure. So this really medicalization of something that now I understand um, needed to be my, I needed to listen to my body. I needed to nurture my body. I needed to pay attention to where my needs weren't getting met and which is what I do now in women's health. Yeah. But at the time um, I was just noticing it in women's health. I was listening to my patients who were telling me about their, their strokes and their blood clots and <laughs> cancer that was related to birth control. And I was like, Oh crud. And I'm like writing this stuff like candy, right? right? Because it's this way to manage these messy symptoms that I don't feel like dealing with in my patients. Right. Right. And so that kind of was the door that opened to open me to this world of, wow, maybe there's more to medicine than just, hmm, hold on. Let me, so this, I am, I was kind of taught that, I'm the one who has the power to fix, control, medicate, deal with the problems that my patients have. Mm -hmm. Turns out, <laughs> right, that is a horrible, horrible <laughs> idea. So... Then the other thing, you know, coming back to this, your, your work, um, another thing that drives me crazy and still does, to be honest, is the powerlessness I feel around people who struggle with eating and their body yeah, and weight yeah, because I cannot fix them. Right. Right. All the Ozempic in the world can't fix them. <laughs> right. And so, you know, it's this powerlessness. It's this powerlessness that I was dealing with. Like, wait a second. It's not my job to fix you. Yeah. Yeah. It's my job to love you and to listen to you and to receive you and to sit with you. Anyway. <laughs> wow. Yes. I, oh, I'm going to just let that linger for a second. Heard it here first, folks. All the Ozempic in the world can't fix you, followed by, it's my job to love you. It's my job to love you. Oh, man. I'm so glad you exist. I'm so glad you exist. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. Truly. What a story. I have a million questions. <laughs> so That's why I'm sitting here with a pen. Okay. First thing that I want to go back to is this idea, well, first of all, like what you're saying about if you as the doctor are trained that you are the solution and you fix people and you solve problems, and then you're sitting with a patient and you can't fix them, what happens in that dynamic around your own projection of your powerlessness right? That is, I can't be the problem. I went to medical school. I have a degree. I have the answer. It's this medication or it's this diet or whatever. And then the patient is still struggling the way, like the, I'm fascinated by this because it makes all the sense in the world, the way that it becomes, I can't be the problem. It's not me that's screwing up as the doctor. It must be you because if anything is the problem here, it's certainly not me. And where I go with that, of course, is, well, okay, how many people <laughs> have been to a doctor struggling with their weight and their doctor says, eat this way, move this way, do this thing, even take this medication and that will solve the problem. And then it doesn't because we're human beings. We're not robots. And then person goes back to the doctor. They are judged, shamed, criticized, told that they are weak, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is so important for people to understand psychologically what's going on there. That is, it's not your fault. You're not broken. You're not doing something wrong. 
It's that the doctor doesn't know how to fix you. And that creates a lot of insecurity, inadequacy, fear, shame, perhaps. And doctors are not taught. I know this is an umbrella statement, right? But part of medical school, I would imagine you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. I've never been. It's not addressing the fact that sometimes you're going to feel powerless and ashamed because you don't know how to help a patient. Here's how we cope with those emotions, right? It becomes, right? she's laughing. <laughs> she, I'm she's sorry, laughing. What are emotions? What are emotions? <laughs> they don't, they don't, we don't deal with that. That's not. Right. So, so it's not part of the training to be a doctor to say, hey, you're getting triggered by your patients. This is what you need to do to sit with that and actually see your patients as human beings. Right. So what happens? Well, we project it and we say, well, you're the problem, which must be I I personally am feeling so validated as someone who has been morbidly obese on the BMI chart going to a doctor being told that I'm the problem because it's like, oh, oh, so you just weren't taught this, right? And I know how I feel when I'm not taught something. I mean, think about it, right? If Especially if you're listening to this, how does your inner child feel when you are taught how to do something and then you can't do it? For me, that brings up so much shame, fear, uncertainty, inadequacy, insecurity. But if I don't know how to sit with that and deal with that, personally, internally, it's just going to go outward. So I think that is such an important point you're making about your experience. And again, this isn't every single doctor. I'm aware of that. But but that's what I'm hearing. And I think I want everyone to know <laughs> that this is very, very often what's happening behind the scenes. And we just don't know it because also they don't know it. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, and it's an incredible bind, to be right. honest. Right. For the doctor, um, it's it's an incredible bind. And then, you know, now that I have been doing some work with internal family systems, parts work, nervous system work, I understand that with patient, a lot of patients are coming to doctors as a an authority mm -hmm. figure, right. almost in this childlike way saying, I need help. Right. Like mom, dad, like I need someone to help me. I feel powerless here. Yeah. And that is going to trigger all of my own mm -hmm. parts that feel mm -hmm. triggered and powerless. And then I feel like, why the heck are you coming to me to ask for things that you should be able to do for yourself? Right. Right. I mean, it's just this crazy dynamic that's going off inside of each one. Yeah. Yes. And so and it wasn't until I could understand and name my own. OK, wait, hold on. What's really going on here? Mm -hmm. What's really going on here? And that's where, you know, when I heard your work and how you were like what saying to people, what happened to you? Like, what is going on? Like, you're you're just inviting them to this beautiful intimacy with themselves to reconnect, you know, to their own wounded parts and love them so that they won't be grasping for that love and that connection from things that can't supply it. Right. Right. Huge. Huge. All of this. Huge, huge. <laughs> Huge. I love it. Okay. So here's my follow up questions. One is I'm interested, you may not have an answer to this, but this was just a curiosity I had while I was hearing it. What allowed you to notice that what was happening in the room with your patients was about you versus, you know, your colleagues and peers that are saying the patient is the problem or the patient has the problem. What allowed you to, to do that or notice that? You know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's a really good question. And I think it's, it's over time. Um, and I think I, it may have something, you know, I'm listening to, to Nicole Sachs's podcast about the chronic 
um, pain, cure for chronic pain and, and things like that. Um, and I've been really curious, of, you know, the, with, uh, Gabor, I mean, um, the body keeps the score, uh, with, um, Vanderkolk. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And realizing I just, at some point in my journey, I, I realized that I had been ignoring my body. I mean, you have to do that in medical school, to be honest. Like yeah. you have to do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So I had just been shoving my body in a corner in a, in a sense and saying, I don't care. I don't care what you feel like. You got to go. You got to go. You got to do. You got to do. And then I just started noticing my own body and what mm -hmm. was happening in my own body. And I had some symptoms that were clearly um, telling me my body, you know, so I just started, became more curious. Yeah. And then I noticed in the exam room, you know, I was just feeling very, um, uh, panicky and, mm. you know, and, 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 and weird. I'm like, oh man, I, this is, this is, you know, before <laughs> this is really annoying, yes. you know, body <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> really annoying, but, um, just starting to listen and just pay attention to myself and yeah. realize that, wow. Like, and just that I'm just very, very curious, you know, that, that, that 17 year old who went to college looking, um, into psychology is still in me. And right, right. I, I, I'm just very, very curious about why we do what we do. And I love to learn that. So yeah. I'm very curious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're a truth seeker, you know, yeah. you're just going to keep chasing it. I, I mean, I, I resonate with that a lot. You know, what, what comes to me when I hear this is it's fascinating to me as someone who went to school for social work and was trained as a therapist, you know, how different the training is. And like, obviously you're going to school for medicine. I'm going to school to work with feelings and do all the like squishy stuff. Right. And it's just so interesting to me how, and I remember reflecting on this very much when I worked with a pediatrician, this is what I found. Like our training was just almost like the inverse of one another, right? Like I was taught that you can't fix people and you can't save people. And ultimately what we're doing is creating like co-creating this container and dynamic that supports people in healing themselves, but it's the complete inverse, you know, I don't have the power I'm working with someone and I know some things, right. I can offer some things, ask some questions, but it's really also interesting to me how I remember, I mean, I spent like half my life, more than half my life at this point in therapy. But I remember at the very beginning of the program for me at NYU, at our orientation, I remember the probably dean of the school welcoming in everyone. NYU, where I went, was a clinical program. So basically everyone there was there to do like clinical one-on-one -on -one work with people. And I remember him saying, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, you know, if you are here because you want to be a therapist, and you are not currently in your own therapy. That is something, you know, we're not going to make it a requirement of the program, but, but really consider that because this is not something that you can do. You're not going to go out there and work with people having never looked at your own stuff. And the entire curriculum, the entire experience of learning how to sit with people. I also remember a professor of mine explaining in the very beginning, you all walk around with bags. You all have bags. We call it baggage. <laughs> you can't get rid of it. There's nothing you can do about it. We all have it. But what it is to be a therapist and sit with people one-on-one -on -one especially is to learn how to leave your bags at the door and sit in front of a human and really see them, love them. That's mm -hmm. where the healing happens. But mm -hmm. the first step is you have to know your own stuff and you have to be practiced at leaving it at the door so you can really see people. And how different that is from the experience of medical school oh. where, right? For me, it was like, get in touch with your body, feel your feelings, notice what's coming up. So much of learning how to sit with people. Then I start working with people. And part of that is, going through and being like, this is where I was triggered. This is what I thought of. This is what I was feeling. This is because that you're the vessel, you're the vessel. So you have to clear out as much as possible, become aware of as much as possible. So you can 
drive yourself <laughs> in a way that is supportive to the person you're working with. And it's so interesting to me how that training was all about getting in touch with myself. And your training was, oh, no, 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 no. Stick your body in a corner, show up, learn how to put band-aids on. Yeah. And repress, and repress, repress. Right. repress. Part of Just the job. Don't bring your feeling. Your feelings are not needed here. We just need your mind, intellect, highly trained. Right. Tool. Yeah. Right. People up is basically what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> People up. Yeah. How do you feel right now? Just like, as you're saying all this, I see your, your <laughs> facial expressions are giving me so much life, but I have access to those people listening. Don't oh, tell me so how you're much. feeling. Yeah. I just have so much compassion for that, that, you know, me at that age, you know, just, I was so, you know, compliant and, you know, whatever you say, I'll do whatever you say, I'll do, you know, um, just get the answers right on the test. Just, you know, just do the pressure, 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 pressure. Right. Um, and so I'm just going to treat my patients how I've been treating myself. Mm. Right. Just get, get yourself together. Right. I have another patient waiting, get yourself together. Let me fix you. And I would be so happy when the patient would come in and say, Oh, I don't have any problems. I'm just here for my checkup. I'm like, Thank right. you know, so, Right. Um, but yeah, so it's, mm. and, and just learning to just, it's okay to feel powerless, yeah. you know, it's okay. And learning to just sit with that and, but it's, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. Very hard to yeah. do that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that's the other thing that's, that I'm feeling and thinking while we're having this conversation is I really have incredible empathy for, you know, you use the word bind, being in that bind and being a human who's trained as a doctor, how, again, for me, how scary I would feel if someone were sitting in front of me and I didn't have the answers and I was expected to have the answers and I was taught to have the answers and it was my responsibility to have the answers and it's my fault if I don't have the answers. Like that, I have so much compassion for being in that place because no one wants to feel that way. Like that yeah. feels so scary. And also I'm thinking about, you know, the, the dynamic that you're talking about, you yeah. were taught that you had all the power and the reason people are coming to you basically asking to be saved from themselves is because we're also taught that you have all the power. <laughs> like the whole culture, you know, is bought into largely the idea that we are broken and if we go to the person in a white coat, we will be fixed. And and how scared we are to show up. And how scared you are to show up. Like it just. Mm. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah and just an another example of that is that the opioid crisis mm -hmm. that we were in. Right. Um, we, you know, still are in, but, you know, the prescription pain medicines, you know, you just see so many examples of how pa how doctors just we have this incredible generally empathy and desire to help, but if we don't have the correct tools, we're just going to give, here's your Xanax, here's mm. your Percocet, here's your, I mean, there is a huge temptation for me to just give the patient just to be the good, the good guy and give the patient what they're asking for. Um, but you know, when, you know, Thomas Aquinas said, you know, g love is willing the good of the other. Mm. Right. And so what is the good for this patient? Is it just to tranquilize them? Right. Or is it to, again, sit with them, love them, let them help them to name that there's something deeper here that needs comfort mm -hmm. that, that 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 this is a sign their pain or their anxiety is a sign that something deeper needs to be be held and to yeah. be known mm. to be loved amen thank you yeah i think another important reason to have this conversation is because you know, when people talk about, especially, you know, going through my group program and like doing some of the homework assignments and really reflecting on 
their relationship with food and their bodies, a lot of the time there's a lot of anger and resentment at doctors. And, and I have my own experience of anger and resentment at my own doctors. But when we let that exist and move and validate that, I also always like to think about, you know, why did my pediatrician send me to Weight Watchers when I was nine years old? Like, why did that actually happen? You know, I have feelings about the fact that that happened and the impact that had on me. But if I zoom out and I stop looking just, you know, zoomed in at my life and I look at the perspective of like, how did I actually get there? Exactly to your point. Well, because my pediatrician wanted to help people. My pediatrician went into medicine because he has a genuine heart. He always did. It always felt that way. He wanted to work with kids. He wanted to help people and families. That's why he went to medical school. And then in medical school, he was taught that if you see a patient that fit my profile at seven, eight, nine years old, this is what you do. This is how you help this kid. This is how you help this family. You send her to Weight Watchers. It's just what he was taught. It's just what you're taught. And so I think there's also, for me, it has helped me look at, reflect on, cope with all of that, because at the end of the day, like, you're also just innocent. It's innocent. It's this is what you were taught to do. You were given the answer. You were given the solution. And what you're doing is passing it along the way you know how. So I also just, I think that's important, you know, that everyone can have their feelings about what it's been like. <laughs> to engage with medical professionals at a higher weight. And that is all really valid. But I also just think, you know, like you said, they have, they have a heart and they are human too. And that's why we're in this predicament yeah. and why it's such a huge problem for so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you, if, if you as a doctor, I, as a doctor, we've been taught to just look at the body without any complexity, without the soul, without the mind, without all the wounds and all the things, then all I have is, you know, these weight loss shots and Weight Watchers and move more, eat less. Ugh. Um, and then when I heard your work, you know, I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> this is it. Like, this is it, right? We have, the body cannot be picked apart and, and, and manipulated over here, which is basically all we do in medicine. Mm -hmm. Like we have to allow the body and soul to be reunited and held together as one, because only when they work together <laughs> will we accomplish anything good. <laughs> Amen. Amen, sister. Yeah, I hear you. And you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're giving people the power to do that. So, so that's, you know, the patient I sent to you, I said, girl, uh-uh, uh-uh, stop, stop. <laughs> you know, we have got to look at the deeper parts mm -hmm. with love. Mm -hmm. We've got to. And yeah, so- Amazing. Thank you for being, helping me not feel so powerless. Cause I can say here, I've got a podcast for you. We've got this work you can do. And I feel like I'm really giving them something. Yeah. Yeah. And you are, I mean, I think specifically about the patient that you sent here, who I know is going to be listening to this, uh -huh. you know, she moved through group, came to the retreat, is in aftercare. It's, it's the community that people can file into and really be seen and heard and cared for. So I'm very excited we get to we get to do this together. So part of I guess this is I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a little redundant of a question, but I was thinking about it before. That is, can you describe like that point that you were at where you said basically what I'm doing in the way that I've been trained isn't working. You're aware of that, you're accepting that, you're coming to terms with that. And then you say, I'm going to practice sitting with people and really listening to them. So it started to transform the way that you're showing up at your work. Can you describe the difference between how you started seeing and treating people versus the way that you were taught to see and treat people? Hmm. So let's see. It's 
the difference between like I think of just a scientist with a specimen, like a dead specimen, like a, a dead <laughs> some sort of creature that that's being poked and prodded and analyzed. And um, in other words, so like, I don't want to hear from you. I just want to analyze you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this idea of like the electronic medical record, you know, we have to please the powers that be by checking all the boxes and making sure we satisfy all the requirements. And you know, by the time you listen to the heart, da da da, you take a couple of, you know, um, vital signs and click, 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 um, that's heartless. Right. And that's so, uh, meanwhile, I look at this person and they are completely like they, they're getting angry. They're getting, um, they're, but I need this. And what about this? And, 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 and there's this real, this just huge disconnect. Whereas, you know, now when I walk in, um, and of course I have to, you know, load up my computer, say hello. And it's so fun. Like, so the first now it's fun because I'm just connecting with a human being. Yeah. That's really what it is. Like this, every person that comes into your orbit is a gift to you. And they are here to teach you something. They are here to teach me about myself. And it's like this reflecting, this is how we become human. Yep. This is how we become human by interacting with other humans, sharing our gifts with each other. So I, um, I'm a huge pet lover. Um, I have a cat and a dog. And um, I found that, you know, a lot of patients, you know, when, when, when I meet them, like, okay, so tell me about you. And they're so funny. They don't, they're not used to that. Right. And so they say, um, well, you know, I've got high blood pressure and I have this problem. I'm like, no, 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 uh, uh, no, 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 no. I don't want to know that. Like right now I want to know who are you? Tell me who are your people? Like, give me some, you know, do you have, and that, you know, you, are you single? Are you, and so these are very relevant mm -hmm. questions. I want to oh, know, yeah. are you lonely or do you have a, a loving people at home that love you? You know, do you enjoy pets? Tell me about your dogs. Let me see the pictures. You know, let's talk about your, you know, and, and like la we laugh together and like, are you retired? And, and and we just, for the few, first few minutes, it's just, I just want you to know I'm human and I just want to know you're human. And um, that's it. Like, let's just be human together for a moment. Yeah. And then you know, I just share, you know, I can kind of get the vibe of what they're, you know, sometimes they're just all business and they just want, you know, and that's fine. And that's fine. Right. And so we just, that's, and that's more, it's just human. Yeah. I'm not a scientist and they're not a specimen. Right. Right. Wow. If your doctor isn't Susan, I don't want it. <laughs> this It's so big. Like who is used to that? I can imagine how many people are listening to this being like, wait, what? That's what a doctor visit sounds like with your primary care physician? Yes. Yes. When it's Susan. <laughs> Thank you. That's, I just, again, I'm just so excited that you exist. I'm so grateful that you're here and that people, that you're, that you're working with people and treating people. Um, okay. Wow. I'm really just like swimming in this right now. I feel like I personally, all ages of me are receiving this right now. Um, So I had another question. I'm going to have to cut out and we're, we're going to have to edit me just like sitting here pondering. I had another question for you about that. But, you know, here's the thought that I had actually while you were saying that. It goes back to my time in grad school. I had another really fantastic professor and something that we would do is every once in a while, we'd have someone in class um, describe a client that they were working with and kind of paint the picture and where are they struggling? What kinds of perspectives can the rest of the class offer about how maybe they could be supported? And I remember my professor saying, here's the question that I want you to consider because we're, we're all still thinking we have all the answers. We know what to do, right? We still have to learn like which approach, which intervention, what's the right way. 
And, and I remember him just floating it out there as like an, as an idea to sit with someone and say, wow, I really wonder what it's like to be them. Not like, what am I going to do? How do I change it and fix it and control it? But like, oh, I'm so interested to learn what it's like to be this person. Mm. And that has been such a guide for me personally. Like I, re- I remember him writing it on the board. I remember that day. And I remember being like, wow, that is everything. And that it sounds like is exactly what you're doing is just sitting down and saying, I'm really curious to learn who are you actually? Not the numbers, not the data. Who are you, the human? And that's where real healing can begin from the inside out, which is very exciting. Yes. I love it. Yes, that's exactly um, that's exactly right. And, you know, I'll admit, like when somebody who's, 350 pounds comes in my office and sits there in front of me and complains. Yeah. I don't know why my leg's swollen. I don't know why my stomach hurts. I don't know why my head hurts. And I go down the list of problems and they have high blood pressure and they have diabetes and they have, you know, you know, there's a part of me that is, feels overwhelmed, you know, because the person in front of me has had enormous, you know, pain, yeah. <laughs> right? And I want, and, and, and I feel power, you know, there's an, like, oh gosh, like, oh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, right? Um, it's so hard to sit in front of someone who I know feels so much grief and so much shame and so much suffering but they're totally out of touch with it right right they're totally out of touch with it um and it it can be dangerous you know what you say i i get that you know i have to be very very careful um and so that that approach you know just just okay hey can we let's just be human together for a minute let's let's see what you're willing to share with me because, you know, they're very closed. Most people, when they go to the doctor, very, yeah. whoop, you know, I hide, I just, you know, right. don't want to show anything. Um, but, you know, I have to stop, like calm down, calm myself down and say, okay, it's not my job to make all of that, the, her problems, his problems go away. Mm-hmm. It's my job right now to just be with, and to let them know they have a partner. Yeah. Yeah. They have someone on their team who's willing to partner with them and walk with them and journey with them and hear them. And um, and and we don't have to do anything today right. to fix that, to fix anything, right? We don't have to fix anything today. Um, and that for me has been like, again, that's me, right? It's about me. It's always about, you know, us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? But just to notice like, wow, like what happened? I want to know your story. I want to hear your pain. I want to, and I can't do all that in one day. I can't. Right. Um, but I don't want them to also feel like here, you need to be fixed. You're t- incredibly broken. Um, here's the name of a podcast. Here's, you know, a counselor. Here's, okay. Yeah. We might get to all that, you know, right. right but right. Um, again, if, if really all we do is, is, remind ourselves that we're human and that we, and I can bear to see them deeper Mm -hmm. than what's right in front of me. I think that's a, a gift. It's huge. And the other thing you're bringing up and saying that I like cannot emphasize this enough because I hear it all the time is the sense of urgency that people receive when they go to the doctor, but again, specifically around weight. So if I am overweight and I go to the doctor, it becomes this like, there is a predator in the room right now. You got to get this weight off your body. You have to do it by yesterday. Like the the guidelines that I've heard my clients receive from medical doctors, you need to lose X amount of pounds by this date. You, it needs to happen. It needs to come off. You need to do this. And then what does that do? Right. Then people, my clients <laughs> come back to me being like, I am in full blown panic because my 
primary care medical doctor, the person in the white coat, the person that knows all the answers and the person that has all the power and the person that's right about everything told me that if I don't lose X amount of pounds by this date, X, Y, and Z, I'm going to die and it's a catastrophe. So the very important thing about this that I've said before on this podcast is if you're in a mindset of, I need to lose weight, like it is life or death. I need to lose weight. Well, what's happening there is now your brain thinks that you are in life-threatening danger and with all the love in the world, good fucking luck. Like you can't get very far if you're running from a predator. So sometimes I like to say, if you're like, okay, well, I do need to lose weight. What I like to remind people is, you know, maybe you would like to lose weight. Maybe you want to lose weight. Maybe it will support your health to lose weight, but the I need to sense of urgency around it is not helping you lose weight. It's not helping you anything. But so it's also amazing to me that you have the awareness to say this isn't about today. Yeah, sure. Maybe weight loss would be good for your health. And this is not coming from a sense of urgency. This is coming from a place of awareness and connection it's grounded. And what that means is it's safe. It doesn't mean we're not going to look at it. And this is going to be my follow-up question for you. It doesn't mean we're not going to look at it. It doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it. It doesn't mean I'm going to sit here and say, don't even worry about your weight, right? Sure. That could be part of the conversation, but we're not going to panic about it because that's not going to help you get anywhere in a long-term, healthy, sustainable, safe way, at least. So Thank you for also offering that and pointing that out because that is the that is probably the biggest bone I have to pick with the stories I've heard of people going to the doctor is that it becomes the charge, the urgency around it becomes so life or death, at least in perception, that it just sends people spiraling in the opposite direction. You can't be productive there. So great work, Susa. <laughs> right. And that happens too. I do a lot of work with women who are trying to get pregnant. Yeah, and we yeah. are trying to, many times, there are just things going on in their nervous system, their body, um, toxicities, different things. And we just need to take a look in, you know, at the body itself, at the relationships, at the sleep, at the, you know, all the little things that, you know, our nervous system either is going, you know, our nervous system is not going to be interested in um, reproduction, if we're in survival exactly, mode, exactly. right? So I'm, so I'm used to that. And, and women come in and they today, like fix me today. And so I realize they're just the, my job is to kind of set the tone of the mindset and the vision of where we're going with this and of the acceptance we need to have just the, the pace, the, yeah, the, the nervous, my nervous system has to kind of help them regulate their nervous system yep. um, around what their goals are. Right. Because if they feel like they need to get pregnant tomorrow, then, uh, well, that is setting us up for failure for a lot of things. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, really it's about setting realistic expectations, which is another thing I talk to people about. It's like, if you, if you think <laughs> that you will be healed after a few days, after a 14 week program, if you think that that's going to be it and then you're done and you never have to pay attention again, right? It's not a realistic expectation. So from the beginning, that's something that's important. Yes. Okay. And wow, just the power of you co-regulating your nervous system with your patients. Like, okay, I, I wish I could give you an award. So many awards. Oh, um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not great at it. I just, well, <laughs> it's a goal. The fact, the fact that it's even in your awareness that that is a thing. There we go. Just in my awareness. There we go. That, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this leads me to another, what I think is a juicy question. I'm very, I personally am very interested to ask you this. So in my experience, as you probably know from listening to the podcast, there is this diet culture that we're familiar with. And then there is this emerging anti-diet culture as well. And 
I'm going to make this very black and white. I understand there's more nuance to it, of course, but the diet culture being, you know, eat less, exercise more. Sounds like to me, diet culture, Western medical model is like all on the same side of things. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we have the anti-diet culture that is saying diets, not only do diets not work, but diets are very harmful and probably the worst thing that we could do. So long-term weight loss is not possible. Don't even try it. If you do, you'll lose weight and then you'll gain it. And the weight cycling is the worst thing that could happen. So don't even bother. And on that side of things, there's also, to me and my perception, the health at every size movement. You can be healthy at every size. Weight does not equal health, right, at all. And if we are looking at a human, it's valid to say, we want to improve health markers, but we can do that without looking at the weight. Don't look at the weight. The weight is not part of the equation. Okay. So that's how I've experienced it. It's polarizing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me, um, neither one of those really resonate. I think they're both too extreme. And my personal philosophy is that, you know, I have a pie chart that I teach in my program. And the pie chart are all kinds of health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual, social, environmental, physiological, and physical health. And all of them are equally split. And then there's like a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of the chart that is your weight. Because to me, that's how I see it, is like the weight is not not relevant. I'm not going to say, let's not look at it at all. I'm not going to say, let's not talk about it. And I'm not going to say, let's definitely try to never, ever attempt weight loss, because I think sometimes it can support your health. This is a personal belief based on my own lived experience in many sizes. So anyway, that's how I find myself in the middle of the pendulum is I have this kind of visual of a pie chart where I understand that weight and health have a connection. Weight does not equal health. That I'm very clear on. But I do think that there is a relationship and that it is valid for a medical doctor to say your health will improve if you lose weight. Okay. You hear what I'm saying? I see your Mm -hmm. head nodding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I feel comfortable where I'm at with this. This is my belief. I'm curious. (laughs) How do you reconcile? How do you engage with? kind of the side the extreme sides of the pendulum you are a medical doctor who's referring people to out of the cave how (laughs) what's that like for you and can you tell me a little bit about your beliefs around the connection of weight and health Hmm. I really I tend I really resonate with what you said I mean the weight is a it's a part of it, right? Just like blood pressure is a part of our health. But if we just tell somebody to get their blood pressure down and not talk about all the components that go with that and how the complexities are, um, I, I think it's actually very similar to, to, you know, when I see high, high blood pressure, mm-hmm. like, ooh, what is going on here? Just like when I see high, high weight, you know, it's almost like a, It's like a little red flag that the body is flagging to say, okay, we've got something going on. Um, What is uh, just, you know, again, lots of compassion. Patients come in. um, I see this a lot. um, And they, they say, I'm doing everything and I'm gaining weight. And the unspoken next line is fix me my body's broken. Right. Um, so the, so we've got a lot of weird beliefs going on with the, in the person and in the doctor, and we bring all of our baggage to that conversation. I, I grew up with a, um, you know, I have a internal critic who is very afraid that if I gain weight, I will not be lovable. Mm-hmm. And she is very, very, very powerful. Um, and she 
is I have a, I have a self soother who loves chocolate, you know? <laughs> so in my system, this, this critic wins yeah, and she shuts that self soother down. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, I know what's going on in me and I'm afraid of gaining weight because I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be low anyway. Like, I just know that. And, and I'm constantly fighting those battles inside. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and trying to soothe my own system and find different ways to soothe. <laughs> so I know that when this person comes in and they're saying I've done everything and you know so you know we try to I try to give them a sense of the complexity that we don't just want to reduce weight to a you know a, I just it's you know like I don't like the color of my hair fix it like it's that simple to just yeah. fix right. it um, because we can do a lot of harm to people if we reduce the complexity to, I mean, again, love is willing the good of the other, right? And so just because you patient cannot handle the complexity of your weight caused by many, 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 many factors, I'm not going to buy into that. And then, you know, um, just try to smash that weight down by I mean, I'm very upset and worried when a patient comes in and they say, oh, I've been on semaglutide and I lost 40 pounds. I don't celebrate with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't reward. Uh, oh, that's so great. You're doing so great. Keep it up. Keep it up. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Hold on. What? <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, first of all. I'm concerned. So I don't want to go down all that, road. but that is, you know, I think again, because, because that could be from a place of starvation. It can be a place of dehydration. It can be a place of um, lo- loss of muscle. It can be anyway, it's, and then you have taught me, you know, that, you know, if you get a lot of praise for losing a lot of weight, that can have its own negative consequences. Oh yeah. Um, and rewarding that kind of, you know, self, you know, mutilation behavior potentially. I don't know. Absolutely. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I just have a million thoughts while you're talking. The first is I remember when I at NYU I gave a speech. And um, it was it was all about basically my work and and what I believe. And I started by, you know, I'm giving these statistics and the data around eating disorders and obesity and what's going on here in the grand scheme of things, both physically as a collective, but also mentally, emotionally as a collective. And, and ultimately to paint the picture that what we're doing is not working, period. It's only getting worse and it's making it worse. And I remember learning, especially when I worked with a doctor about, you know, my philosophy is every time a human being is reduced to a set of numbers, it fails to uphold the fundamental medical principle of first do no harm. Period. If you are reducing a human to a set of numbers, right, you take an oath as a doctor, first, do no harm. If what you're doing is is reducing someone to a set of numbers, you are doing harm. You are actually first doing harm. Before you do anything else, you're doing harm. And that stood out to me. When I learned that first do no harm was like, you know, the mantra of medical school or whatever, I was like, oh, well, that's interesting because of how harmful (laughs) this is. So Anyway, I think about aligning, realigning, I've written papers about this, realigning the first, the, you know, the front line of medical care with one of the values of the profession of social work, which is the dignity and worth of the human being. Like, what would that be like? Yes. And we don't even know what harm is anymore. Right. We've lost the concept of harm. You know, we can do whatever a person consents to. And we've lost, you know, a lot of guiding principles and right. What is a human being we've lost? I mean, we, yes, right. We're in, we're in a, a pickle. We really, yeah. 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 And, and so I think again, each time we can 
help someone to see who they are and recognize their own power, their own agency, yeah, their own dignity, their own ability to take control of their own lives and not hand their power over to someone else, that's a huge work in the world. Absolutely. Huge. Okay. I have another question for you. This feels like such a weird question to ask you on this podcast. Like I might in hindsight be like, we should cut that one out. I don't know, but it feels very like it really wants to come out. And I can tell you that it definitely wants to come out because of my own personal interests. Like I'm like, "Mm, I'm sitting with a medical doctor. I want to know how she's going to answer this. So that's where it's coming from. That is, um, I have heard many times that, you know, this argument, I can't, I can't seem to get over this, (laughs) this argument that is long-term weight loss is not possible, period. Don't even try it, period. If you do, it will end up worse for your health than if you don't, period. It's very black and white. And I, the reason I admit I can't get over it is because, well, I'm someone who has lost a lot of weight and maintained it and I am not living with an eating disorder and I'm not yo-yo dieting. So like what I've lived and experienced according to that belief literally can't happen and isn't possible. And so sometimes I think, well, how do you reconcile people like me? How do you, how do you speak to what I've been through and what I've done if it, in your opinion, cannot be done? And I've had people on this podcast who will suggest it cannot be done. Don't even try it. Okay. So I am curious <laughs> from your perspective, here's the question I'm actually getting to. If someone is Again, we're using the BMI chart, which you and I both know is bullshit and outdated and this and that. But okay, if we're using it to say you're working with someone who is morbidly obese, we can use myself as an example. Okay, I'm 300 pounds at 17 years old. I'm your patient. What I'm actually curious about, because I don't know the answer to this and I don't know that I'd be able to explain it to anyone. Can you articulate what's unhealthy about that? Can you, do you actually know, like what, why is it actually that having excess weight on the body is not healthy Mm. from a medical perspective? Because I think there's a place for that, Mm. you know, because in my experience personally, I wasn't yet diabetic. I had okay cholesterol, blood pressure, all this, like my numbers were okay which was a quote unquote miracle every time I went and the pediatrician told me that. But I get kind of curious, mm-hmm. maybe for for <laughs> ammunition of some sort, <laughs> that's mm-hmm. like, no, it does make sense to try to lose weight because of the connection it has to your overall holistic health. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So So to be in a body, so our musculoskeletal system was not designed to hold up 300 pounds on a frame of whatever, I'm sure, you know, like in other words, it's not, not, okay. Our heart is not designed to pump blood to sustain, okay. Our lungs are not designed, okay. Um, Our airway is not designed. There will be collapse. There will be sleep apnea. Right. Um, insulin, the hormone insulin drives cancer. So just a, a little aside that is so helpful when I, when I heard this, um, each of us has a genetic capacity to tolerate an intake of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates turn to sugar And it's the only macronutrient that we don't need to take in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies make it. So we don't, that's the only one we don't need. So we have a genetic like capacity. So when we overwhelm that capacity by eating carbs that are in excess of our our capacity, um, our body does us a favor because high blood sugar can be, can kill us. So our body does us a favor and it stores that energy as fat. Okay. 
And your body at 300 pounds, 17 years old, was doing a great job of saving you from diabetes mm -hmm. by storing that extra carb uh, energy in your fat. Bravo, Lisa's body, mm -hmm. right? Doing a great job. And so in a sense that kept you from being diabetic, it did. And it, and, and it did because once we over, we, we get to the point where now our body can't do that anymore and our blood sugar starts to rise, all the things that go with high blood sugar, um, our immune system cannot function. Our, but even at, even the insulin that was happening in your body, the insulin levels and things like that were destructive. They were destroying you and you didn't realize it, mm -hmm. right? So really we have to come to grips with our, our um, at some point, every single one of us, no matter what kind of body we're in, we all have to come to grips with our relationship to carbs. Mm -hmm. How much can we personally tolerate without us it making us sick? It's a it, it can be poisonous, especially in the in the culture that we're in right now. Right, um, we're not in a third world country. We have you know fruit not just once a year during the rainy season, but we have it all the time. <laughs> You know, and so our bodies are not really equipped for that, to have mm -hmm. constant fruit and constant bread and constant everything. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I think that's important to know. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, the first thing, it's so interesting. I mean, you start with like the mus muscular skeletal system. And I sometimes share how when I was 16, 17, between probably 280 and 300 in high school, I started getting stress fractures in my feet and mm -hmm. how I remember like going to the doctor because my foot hurt. And I remember being told that it was a stress fracture. And I was like, you know, well, what, what does that mean? And being explained to me that I just, my body wasn't designed to hold this much weight. And I remember like riding home in the car from that doctor appointment being like, my body is literally breaking because of the weight that it is. Like what it was like to just know that a stress fracture is a break. It happens for quote unquote, no other reason. It was a stress fracture. Like that's how much stress was on my body that my, the bones in my feet were breaking. So when I hear you say, you know, well, let's just start with the fact that you weren't, you're not designed to hold this kind of weight. My body is like, oh, I feel that because I know that I have lived that. So thank you. And also in hindsight, I know exactly why I asked you that question. And I'm so glad that you answered it because to me, part of living in the quote unquote middle of the pendulum is being aware and being educated and informed. It's not swinging the pendulum to neglect and ignorance, right? It's not saying, I don't want to know about that. I don't want to look at my weight. I don't want to pay attention to that because it's too emotionally uncomfortable. I'm just going to not do that, right? Right. But there's something to me very powerful. Knowledge is power. I believe that wholeheartedly. And so when I hear what you're saying, there's something really cool to me personally, not everyone feels this way, that what you're saying is just objective. It's fact. It's science. It's medicine. It doesn't make me the patient, 300 pounds at 17 years old, doesn't make me bad, doesn't make me wrong, doesn't make me the problem doesn't mean anything about my worth or value or character. It means nothing about how lovable I am. It's not about me. It's science that the body isn't designed for this. The heart, the lungs, the system, the skeleton, it wasn't made for this. And that's not about me. <laughs> but there's something really important, again, about saying this is this is fact. <laughs> it means nothing about the person. And I think that is so important 
for people to understand that you can look at this information and not freak out and not panic or freak out and panic and know that it's safe to do so, right? But it's like, there's no urgency around it. But if we are telling the truth and we have the bravery and the strength to really tell the truth, there is a correlation between your weight and your health. And it doesn't mean anything about you, but sometimes it really can support your system long-term holistically to move through something like intentional weight loss. Not because you're a failure if you don't, not because you're a bad person if you don't, not because you will be any more lovable than you are right now or have any more value, but because this is scientific fact, period. And I feel like that has supported me every step of the way of my journey. It just became, it, I felt so aware <laughs> That I'm, my body is breaking. It is self-compassion to lose weight. It's not because I'm the problem. It's because my body can't do this for very long. And I saw the writing on the wall. It was getting to a point where I could barely like move, you know, taking a walk meant my back hurt. I could barely get up a flight of stairs. It was like, I, it was, it was coming for me. That's what it felt like. And it's just, I, I, does what I'm saying make sense? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And just, you know, the reality, I'm just, I'm just thinking of, you know, the body soul connection again, because if we try to get at this just with, you know, the truth of the science and, you know, you know, let's just get you some, a weight loss shot or a gastric bypass or whatever it is then you know and not acknowledging the deeper reality of the story your story that got that allowed you to get to that point then what are we even doing you know like what are we even doing um and I'm just reminded of the day-to-day, you know, the people I see day-to-day who may be not somebody who would work with you on your program, but we're in a crisis right now of food and our body. We are in a crisis. Um, We, I have patients who these glucose monitors are now, the continuous glucose monitors are now, you know, very, very easy to get and people are bringing it coming in and um, and they're saying, you know, I wore my glucose monitor um, and I, I see what the food is doing to me. I see, you know, and I can't do it. Like I can't, like I can see that, you know, the spikes and I can see, and I know I'm supposed to keep the spikes, blah, blah, blah. But like, I can't, I can't do it. So we are so, and that's what is so important that with the work you do, this is literally, we have come to believe. And so like validly that, food like we uh, how can I say this because we need food to live right we absolutely need food to live but food has become a source of connection a source of comfort a source of life Mm -hmm. that's bigger than our body Mm -hmm. just you know I I, I learned this from my mom who died um, of lung cancer and she smoked till the very very end yeah, and yeah. she told, and I was like, no, you, know, you got lung cancer. Can you please stop smoking? And you know, what's going on? And she's like, listen. And she just looked at me and said, listen, she said, my cigarettes have been with me when no one else has been with me. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, I got it. Yep. Like this is bigger than cigarettes. You know, this is bigger than cigarettes. Like and I don't know the the nuances of her story. Um, but what happens is if if we come to believe that light food, whatever food it is, now I'm cracking up because it is like like cigarettes won't bring us life, right? But food does bring us life. So this is right. where it gets real. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. knots and the messiness, right? Yep. But it, it's the same thing. Yep. Like we in our body, if our body comes to believe that having this type of food or this food, like 
I cannot live without this. Yep. Like I've come to believe that in my story, if that someone has come, then forget the, you know, forget the weight loss shots, forget the, like, we've got to get into that, the heart of it. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to tell you that, but yeah. that's, it's like, yeah. 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 Well, that is, that is exactly what it is. And like, you get that so deeply the way it's not about the cigarettes. It's not about the food. It's, it's about, again, how, how is it that someone who has lung cancer is still smoking cigarettes is the same question as like, how is it that someone who is struggling so much with their weight and food and diabetes and all the metabolic syndrome that comes from all of that? Like, how is it? that we still just keep showing up because we, we act like addicts around food. Many of us have an addictive relationship with food for that reason. So yes, a hundred percent. And I need to just like also what this reminds me of, and I want to give a shout out, Dr. David Wiss, who was on this podcast. I love and adore. And I think his work and his research is so important because one of the things that he's doing, and he's such a pioneer in this world of, kind of the cross section between understanding addiction and also applied nutrition. And so his whole thing is about nutrition for mental health. How are you eating and how is that going to impact your mental health? No, we're not talking about weight. We're not, you know, right. So anyway, I love his work. Recommend everyone check him out. The wise mind app is his app anyway. But one of the things that he is drawing awareness to is the way that this, the pendulum has swung. He just um, published a paper about this, how the pendulum swung to treatment for eating disorders to include the quote unquote, all foods fit model, right? Because if someone is avoidant and restrictive, especially to an extreme around certain foods, then eating disorder treatment, most of the time swings the pendulum and says all foods fit. And for some people, that really works. It creates this freedom and peace and safety around all foods. And then you go on and live your life. Great. Well, his point is it doesn't work for everyone. It's actually harmful for some people because so much of the food that we're eating isn't real food. <laughs> so, so much of the food that people feel addicted to is because it's manufactured to be addictive. <laughs> that's not that's not food. That's not real food. So the way that the body is not designed to metabolize it, nor is our brain. This is not real food that we're eating. So a lot of the time, you know, I have a focus, yes, on real food. I'm not going to tell you what to eat and not to eat or, you know, I don't do meal plans and diets, but I am going to say, <laughs> again, middle of the pendulum, some of the food that you're eating is not real food and that's going to affect your body. It's also going to affect your brain and it's going more than anything to me going to affect the emotional relationship and connection you have with it. So if you're eating a food where you feel completely addicted, right? The same way it's like, I see what it's doing to me and I can't stop. My first question would be, well, what is that food? Like, what is that thing that you feel so compulsive and addictive around? Because most of the time, not always, most of the time, it's not a food that was grown from the earth. It's not like you're binging on apples and broccoli for a reason, right? The reason you eat an entire sleeve of Oreos is because they know exactly how to make them so you cannot put them down. And that's not a... I, you know, it's, it's a combination of the kind of like filling the void emotionally, spiritually, socially, absolutely. Right. Cigarettes were the only thing that has always been there for me. I know what that feels like around food. This is my companion. This is my friend. Right. Yeah. But part of that is also, well, does it feel that way because of the neurochemical reaction you're having to it because it was manufactured to affect your system that way? Like, is it true that all foods fit? Because for some of us, I don't feel that way. I have to be mindful about what I'm putting into my body because of how my brain's going to react to it. And this is not something we had to worry about a hundred years ago. This is something we have to worry about now. So anyway, <laughs> it's all of it. And that again is where it gets, it's very nuanced. It gets very messy. It does. And what works for one person doesn't work for other people. 
Amen. But that's to me, the essence of the quote unquote middle, the middle ground is to say, we need to look at addiction crossover with eating disorder treatment and how we're really, how we're really supporting people. So anyway, but <laughs> thank you for that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to be mindful of time. Cause I, I know I say this all the time, but like, I want to do a hundred episodes with you and talk about literally everything. <laughs> but I feel like if I were listening to this and I know the people who are listening to this, there is one question I want to ask you before we go, because we're talking about it. We're mentioning it, it comes up every, every few minutes. Tell me your thoughts on Ozempic, GLP-1, semaglutide, mm-hmm. yada, yada. Mm-hmm. How, what is your relationship with that, given that you are trained as a medical doctor, believe that weight loss can happen and sometimes should? You're also an out of the cave practitioner. That's the award I want to give you the out of the cave practitioner award. Um, how do you exist in this world? I have no idea what your answer is going to be to this. I'm so curious. Well, in the world I'm in, so I, I'm not, I don't have my private, my own private clinic. All of my patients have insurance. Um, I do not really have the luxury to prescribe these medications for weight loss by and large, mm-hmm. um, by and large. Okay. So you know that um, over 90% of America is either obese, pre-diabetic or diabetic. So if we were to prescribe these medicines for everyone who wanted them, needed them, you know, we would go broke from a healthcare um, standpoint. So a lot of the drug companies have, you know, gone, gone ahead and said, we don't prescribe, we don't um, allow it for weight loss. So, so it's not something that I often have the luxury, if you will, of prescribing. Um, I'm also a very responsible provider. I try to be a very responsible provider when I provide anything, prescribe anything. I want people to know what they're taking, why they're taking it, when they're going to start it, why they're going to stop it, if they're going to stop. And so um, I did prescribe, I think I prescribed it this week, actually, for someone. Um, And, you know, I don't know if they'll get it. I don't know if their insurance will pay, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, we always, I think it's a tool, basically. It's a tool in the toolbox. But I tell people that this does not, if you don't have time, if you're sitting in front of me telling me, you do not have the time to pay attention to what you eat. And you don't have time to pay attention to, you know, the foundations of your health, the quality of your sleep, how much water you're drinking, you know, how much movement you're getting. Um, if you don't have time to to meal prep, in other words, to, to, to plan what you're eating, to prioritize protein, to make sure you're getting some strength training. In other words, if if people were doing the the prep work that would make the semaglutide, for example, effective, they wouldn't need semaglutide. Right. So I tell that to everyone. <laughs> they don't like it. Um, but you know, and I, I, you know, recommend that they have some sort of way to test their body composition. What was your lean body mass before the shot? And what is your lean body mass a month in, two months in? We have to have a way of finding this out um, because we have to do this responsibly. And then I did see someone yesterday who I haven't seen in a year and she struggled with weight, you know, a long time. And um, she said, I tried it. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. like okay yeah. yeah yeah and how how are you doing with that you know she didn't want to talk about it. you know she was just like very very upset because it doesn't work for everyone mm-hmm. I don't think it's a magic it's not we have to so look this is this is what I believe oh, gosh <laughs> we have no desire generally have no desire no patience to deal with reality when it comes to our own feelings, desires, emotions, body. We have no desire. We would prefer to live outside in, you know, 
connected, disconnected, however you want to say it, with the world. Um, and we don't want to look inside. It's way too messy. It's dark. It's scary. Um, but we will never be fully alive and fully human until we do. So, and that's going to look like a lot of things on the outside, but we need to wake up and we need to just vow. Okay. Yes. I'm going to wake up, stay awake and I'm going to be human. I'm going to come out of the cave. Yes. I'm going to come out of the cave and I'm going to stay there yeah. because sometimes it's really like good looking in there. Like, Ooh, I'm just going to climb back in there and forget yep. about all this messy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's, you know, it's really cool because I would say you and I, again, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that I feel very aligned with your answer just ideologically to that question. And I haven't yet, I, I feel like I keep teasing that I'm going to like do an entire podcast episode on Ozempic because I've been asked by many people to be like, you know, what's your public statement about how you feel about all this? And so I have a lot to say and I'm not going to go into that right now, but I think this is a really, this basically sums it up where for me, you know, someone recently said to me like, I'm thinking about doing it or my doctor has, has brought it up to me and my, my feeling about it is, you know, very, again, nuanced and complex because I have been in that body, in that situation where it's like, sometimes, like you said, it can be a tool. I'm not going to say across the board, you know, don't do it. That to me is again, very just like one side of the pendulum, but I have the same reaction that is like, all right, listen, Ozempic, no Ozempic. I don't really care. But do you have any idea what you're eating every day? Like, can we just start with like, do you know where you're at in terms of food intake? What kinds of foods, when you're eating, how much you eat? Do you know? Because for me, again, when I was 300 pounds, I would have loved. Oh, my God. My dream. <laughs> was to go to the doctor and get a shot. And then my weight would change. Like that was the dream. I understand and can deeply empathize with the desire and the pull. Sure. And at the same time, if you asked me, especially at that age, do you know what you're eating every day? I would laugh in your face. Do I have an idea of what I'm eating every day? <laughs> Absolutely not. Let alone putting intention and mindfulness and, and choice, you know, behind the food that I'm eating, paying attention to things like movement, meal prep. Absolutely fucking not. <laughs> right. And to your point, if I did, my weight would not be what it was. So that's it. And I mean, like, I'm, I'm just sitting here being like, wow, cool. Everything that I teach in my program is part of your answer. It's like, pay attention to what you're eating. Sure. You can know your weight. You can be intentional about weight loss. The question is, how are you doing it? And if the approach is, I'm just going to keep getting these shots, stay in the cave, keep my eyes closed, not pay any attention. It's still coming from that place of something else is going to save me. Something else outside of me is going to take away this problem. And then I don't have to be connected to me. And I don't have to be responsible for my health and my body and my well-being. It's it's still operating from the something else is going to save me place, which again, you know, I have so much empathy for. I have so much compassion. If you feel like you are in too deep that you cannot be saved, right? And then this thing comes along and you see magic pill. You know, I'm not, who am I to sit here and say, don't take it? go ahead. Sometimes it's just too hard without it. I get it. I get it. You know, but that also, this is why I haven't yet spoken about it because it's just going to be like an hour long of me being like, well, there's this to consider and also this to consider. And mm -hmm. I've been all over that spectrum. It's mm -hmm. different for everyone. Then, yeah. You know, think about the despair that you feel on the other side of it, not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the patient I saw recently right. and she said it didn't work. I did it and it didn't work. And she was, you know, you could just, I could sense this anger, you know, and this resentment and the despair, almost a despair of like, I guess I'm just broken. Right. You know, I guess nothing's fixing me now. Right. Oh, yeah. Heartbroken for that. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you for, gosh, everything. Like I said, I 
could sit here forever. I would love to have you back here as, as things evolve, you know, I'm just going to keep coming up with questions and you're going to be the, the out of the cave medical doctor consultant. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I with love you. it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and for being you. Is there anything else you want to just share or speak to before we go? Anything we didn't get to that feels important? Or just any final words of wisdom, anything you want to leave the people with? Hmm, No, I think um, I'm just so grateful that um, there are people like you um, speaking this truth and so grateful that you have an audience. (laughs) who's willing to listen because listen, this is hard. Being human is hard. Seeing other humans in all their messiness is hard. So I would just say to everyone, just be not afraid. We can do this together. Mic drop. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you so powerful. I feel like I'm going to listen to this episode over and over again. (laughs) All right, my friend, thank you for being here. Thank you for being everything that you are truly, truly on behalf of me and all the people that get to receive this. And I can't wait to have you back and just continue the conversation. Yes. Yes. All right. Until next time. Okay. (laughs)